But if my first lesson is welcome to the academy, I like to show you this uh, Berimbolo to back take. People leave jujitsu at that point, or the warm up is so hard for them they can't even complete the warm up. The poor guy or girl goes away and says that jujitsu is for for elite elitists, it's for athletes, and that's crazy to me, Abe. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Eddie Cohn. But before we get to that, my friends, there's a new website for the show. Check out www.mainideapodcast.com or click the link in the show notes and become part of the community. If you join the mailing list, you'll be the first to hear about Ask Me Anything, show merchandise, products I'm using to help me perform at my best, and future events related to the show. You can also find links to connect as a potential show guest or sponsor. And if you feel so inclined, leave a donation to help keep the lights on. For the true fans, leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me continually bring on incredible guests. There's also now timestamps in the show notes, so feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Eddie Cohn is a fourth-degree jiu-jitsu black belt under Jiu-Jitsu Global Federation and owner of Eddie Cohn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in London. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Without further ado, Eddie Cohn. Seconds or so, and and we'll see. Because it's it's been such that the person cuts out and then they come back. But we look like uh, my hair look all right. Go. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) the hair looks great, Eddie. Thank (laughs) you so much for taking the time to be here, brother. I know we've been trying to coordinate and uh, and get you on the show for a little bit here, but. In London, I think it's almost midnight or something like that. It's yeah, crazy. So pretty, thank you for being close. here. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks for uh, giving me a space and, and having me uh, on your amazing podcast. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really exciting being able to talk to people that have you know committed their, their life to martial arts. It was something that I grew up very obsessed with, but I never had an outlet to participate in it growing up in a, a small ski town. So being able to connect with people all over the world that really make this part of who they are, it means a lot. When did martial arts first click for you? And martial arts for me began at a very early age with the uh, with the system of karate in the in the UK here. Mm-hmm. There was a huge push on on karate. So uh, I think I can remember around nine, ten years old, perhaps as far back as I can remember. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of karate for a while, and then it it, it moved up, moved on from there, but. But that's where it started for me, the the old Chuck Norris days, if you like. <laughs> so I had this, uh, my one of my strangest but oldest memories of martial arts was I took an Aikido class when I was super little. And they were doing this like, uh, you know, if a train's coming down the tracks, get out of the way and let it go by. And it was all this stuff. But I, I remember my perception of, of the professor, whoever was teaching at the time, was this like, Oh my, you know, they're larger than life figure. And it it just seemed like, ah, I got to know more about that. But, uh, you know, at some point you realize, especially after you do this for a while, there's a lot of fake news out there in the martial arts world. And there's a lot of things that, you know, don't hold up. There's incredible martial artists like Leota Machida and Stephen Thompson and guys that hold true to like these original styles and you Mm. watch it on display in, in an arena that really matters. When you think back to that time, the introduction in karate, and then ultimately, you know, your lifestyle really revolving around jujitsu and spreading the knowledge that you've learned and helping professional athletes, can you remember the point where you you started to see like the values shift of of the worth of one martial art versus the other in terms of like real world application? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I embarked on this karate journey it was parents pushing me into this and it was kind of a guided um approach to training and one thing that always stuck out to me was the these kata forms that i could never get with you know they had their place for sure and one day i was training with a friend of mine who 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 did thai boxing and he hit me from angles that these kind of blocks 
just weren't cutting it. And uh, <laughs> it was at that point I, I thought of said, yeah, uh, I need to make the switch here. And I switched to Thai boxing for a while. Um, and that was great. I mean, some of those strikes are very applicable in in the style of jujitsu that, that, that I teach and that I learn. Um, and from a, a little bit of research on you, I believe we, we come from the same team, the same instructors uh, from the yeah. Gracie Almighty schools, you know, so um so yeah it was that was the, the switching point for me to Thai boxing yeah uh, loved, so did loved you that for a while. Were, did you ever uh compete in Thai boxing like a pkf or, or any of those yeah like, we, point we, style tournaments absolutely we had our own style here there was the uh bikma it was called the british international kickboxing and martial arts association um and and that was a kind of mix of every striking style could go in there and, and, and compete. And, and I did a few of those, but I always felt a, that there was something lacking at the age old thing. There's something here that's missing. Yeah. There's something here missing. And then fast forward to, to 93, if you like, when I saw Hoyce, I knew I actually, it struck such a chord with me. Um, I lived in a house. You're with, talking about uh, UFC, UFC one. UFC like when you one. Saw, yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I saw Hoyce doing his thing, um, man, I knew at that point that, that this is something special. He was taking on everyone, karate, kickboxing, yeah. judo, wrestling. Like it was unbelievable and no rules, no rounds, no time limits, no gloves. And I can remember watching the first fight, the opening fight, I believe it was Gerard Godot versus the Samoan mm -hmm. guy who I don't remember his name. And he drops the guy and, and kicks his front teeth out. <laughs> And I was like, this is serious. You know, this is some serious stuff yeah. here. Um, and, and, and listen, let me, let me just quantify something here. Do you remember Remco Pardo, the, the judo guy who Hoist fought? Rem, Remco, I don't. Pa okay, so Remco Pardo, he... In, 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 in a UFC. Valley Tudo or in, in UFC? In UFC. 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 And uh, I, I oh. believe it was UFC 1. He fought a Thai boxer called Orlando Wheat, who was from Holland. Who'd I, who I do I, remember yeah, that. Yeah, who I and he elbows the guy. Yeah, uh, uh, it shows you know the the clinch work of judo, the takedown, the elbows. I uh, I was heavily into Thai boxing at that time, and I recently connected on social media with Remco Pardo, and we've had dialogue and uh, no way, amazing guy. Yeah, he's doing some amazing stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like that was the kind of fundamental foundation transition into martial arts for me. And along the way, I, I dabbled in a few other things, but nothing of note, nothing that I thought, wow, this is, this is the thing. This episode is brought to you by Worth Defending, the best-selling story of America's first BJJ student and the martial arts revolution he helped create. Richard Bressler was Hori and Gracie's first student in Los Angeles and is widely recognized as the first American student of BJJ. For nearly 20 years, he worked closely alongside Hori and Gracie, helping to spread jiu-jitsu through the Gracie garages, challenge matches, the founding of the Gracie Academy, and the creation and inception of the UFC. When I picked up Worth Defending last year, I couldn't put it down. The story beautifully expressed Richard's inspiring story of finding jiu-jitsu at the right time in most certainly the right place. The story was so incredible, I asked Richard to join me for episode 53, which you can find in the show notes. With endorsements from BJJ luminaries such as Pedro Sauer, Henner Gracie, and Robert Drysdale, and nearly 300 five-star ratings from readers just like you, Worth Defending is guaranteed to enlighten and inspire. So don't wait. Learn the story of the Gracies and how the UFC that you think you know came to be. Check out Worth Defending today. Available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Visit worthdefendingbook.com for more information and to order your copy. What what was it that that drew you to that? I, there's it's so common when I talk to people that I hear a story of, uh, you know, there was like some sort of bullying or, or being put down or being kept down, mm. and it it kind of moved the person around until they reached out to find this space where they could learn to like stick up for themselves or feel better about themselves or build confidence. Maybe it was their parents pushing them into it because they saw how they interact in the community. But then there's other people that you know stumbled upon it at different points in life and just find a, a different door to walk in. 
what was there any kind of you know environment like that that really pushed you into i need this not just i'm interested in this yeah i think for me it was being or, or developing the martial arts if you like um being a martial artist and developing the martial arts are two totally different things they sit totally differently um the martial artist or the bowing society that that we know it to be um with the etica and which i'm absolutely for has its place and then developing the techniques like what would work and and being a smaller uh human if you like i've always had friends who were bigger than me who would jump on me and play wrestling and we'd never hit each other but i could never get out from underneath and and then of course seeing hoist doing his thing was was for me magic but i never wanted yeah. to crack one of my i couldn't do tie boxing on my friends it would it would just be immoral yeah. you know it would be uh like going to a playground and bullying kids so so yeah they would just sit on me and it, it came from that environment yeah the mar like jujitsu specifically is it's pretty impressive i think especially if you look at that time frame of when it was, it was so many challenge matches were going on and you know horians and south bay proving it hoist is proving it Hickson's proving it. And, you know, everyone was, they were proving jujitsu in any mm. capacity that someone would give them the opportunity. They were really going to bat for this thing that they have popularized. And they were putting it to the test in real time so other people could see it. I, you don't see that as much anymore, I, I think, because of how dynamic striking has, like, how dynamic striking and wrestling and jujitsu have all come together. And you see this on display in, in the UFC all the time. Like, it's a much harder puzzle to solve today than it, not to discredit what they did. What they did was, I mean, it had never been done before, mm. but I wonder what are your thoughts? If, if you had a, a fighter, could you even have a fighter like that bring something so nuanced into the, the mixed martial arts arena and find success with it? I think there are two points that you're, you're raising here. And I think the first one is, Back then, it was a style against a style. No one was mm -hmm. really developing a mixed martial art. I mean, what is mixed martial arts when we think about that? If you if you go back in history, we have the Brazilian term Vale Tudo. In America, they had NHB or No Holds Barred. Uh, then it became Free Fight in the UK. And, and it was all kind of, they, they had their own ideas and concepts. But one thing was absolutely categorically, you know, you couldn't deny it even today, that every, every champion or every dynamic martial artist uses jujitsu or some form of grappling in their system, mm -hmm. even today. So back then, the Gracies uh, didn't come from a real bowing society, in my opinion, from, from being around them and understanding a little bit more about mm -hmm. what they do. Um, I felt they came from a, a background of, oh, you're a tough guy. Let's see how tough you really are. Um, right. So, so it was developed in a way that it came from the streets. I, I can remember being in Brazil in, in 96 and people ask, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm training at the Gracie Academy Jiu Jitsu. And, and they would look at you like you're a thug. You know, they look at you like you're a hooligan. <laughs> so I do remember those times, you know, um, talking to girls on the beach. Oh, what do you, I train Jiu Jitsu. I'm here training. They look at you weird. You'd get these weird things. Um, and then of course there were Jiu Jitsu guys going to, to parties and, and having fights and, and, and just constantly proving the efficiency of it. The second side of that is, when we're talking about jujitsu now, when I talk about jujitsu, I'm not talking about modern jujitsu. I have to make that clear from the beginning. I'm talking about the original jujitsu, which was taught by Grandmaster Elio and his sons, Hoyler, Hickson, Hoyce, Holker, uh, and their cousins, Henzo, in the original days, and all of them, before it became this, this sport, this kind of spectacle, because... Right. Jiu-Jitsu has to me and will always be a self-defense art, firstly. No rules, no rounds, no weight limits, no time divisions, nothing. How to handle serious business outside should it arise. And I think that's the second component of Jiu-Jitsu that people forget. If you remember, Horian on a Saturday would invite people to the academy and open doors 
anyone can come in and challenge them. And waiting for them was this pack of wolves snarling, you know, hoy, 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 <laughs> you know, uh, hoy on himself and, and would just make a mockery out of these, the, the Gracie challenge videos are out there. Um, so, so I feel that talking about those early days of jujitsu, they're still reminiscent today. It depends on the school you go to. 90% of schools today don't have a self-defense program. In fact, I would say that 90% yeah. w without talking bad about anyone are not even teaching students self-defense. They're teaching them a self-defense system, which is laying on their back, putting someone in the closed guard. Not the best way to defend yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so exactly. So the marketing around yeah. this and, and listen, let's, let me quantify what I'm saying because a lot of people are going to maybe find that a little controversial. Yeah. Andre Galvao and, uh, Gordon, Gordon Ryan, when they had this thing, yep. Andre Galvao got slapped twice in the face before he was in the fight. If you train jujitsu for self-defense, for great Gracie, pure Gracie jujitsu, the guy shouldn't even be in your space. If he, if there's some kind of argument, shouldn't even be there. You mean, you mean, uh, Gordon was slapped twice by Galvao prior no. to them engaging. No, Gord, Gordon Ryan slaps Andre Galvao twice. Did he? Yeah. Prior to their match. I, I believe it was. Gordon oh, Ryan. I got you. Prior to the match. Prior on that hype yes, to the before, match. Yeah. Correct. Got you, got you. Yeah. Not Sorry. the match itself. Yes. No, I not the match itself. Yep. No, they were very, yep. it was a gentlemanly uh, match. Right. But, right. but that said, if you go back to 1952 and you slap one of the Gracies or attempt to, what do you think is going to happen? And this is where the, the working ethics of jujitsu for self-defense versus I'm teaching self-defense in this jujitsu school but I'm not, I'm teaching something totally different. There's... I'm so I'm, I'm unsure. I'm unsure what I think, like what I think is, is best. I don't know because I, on, I see two sides of it. Like mm. we, we're not talking about fortunate. best and I'm not, I'm not criticizing Fair. anyone. I'm, I'm talking about what jujitsu was, what we spoke about in the beginning how it is now in its state of play with the UFC, because it's a sport regardless. It's not a fight anymore. It has rules, rounds, right. weight, and it has to be like that. And I appreciate that. I love the sport. I think it's great. I have UFC fighters and elite athletes that train here. Um, but I feel that jujitsu self-defense is very different from modern jujitsu. Certainly, certainly. I mean, especially from the Humaita school approach, like the the Gracie combatives approach to how you should act in in a situation. A lot of it to what you said earlier: distance management first and foremost, right? It, can I can I get away from Eddie if I don't like Eddie coming towards me? First and foremost, and then if he gets too close to me, now what happens? And they teach ways in which you can be a smaller person. And have that interaction happen with someone's bigger and you can be okay. Or you can be okay long enough that someone else can come and help or delay time or, or create space. And I would agree. I think that there's definitely, and, and especially with the growth of the UFC, with the growth of ADCC, AIGA, you know, EBI, all these Polaris, everything that's, yeah. yeah, anything that's like a spectacle, that's exciting, that's fun to watch as a, a spectator, they want people to be able to come in not understand the sport, but be able to watch. Mm. And the, the reality is that if you don't understand jujitsu, watching a gi match is kind of complicated. There's a lot going on that's tough to Absolutely. understand as a, a person who's not involved in it. And so it, it has this, it's not, I don't want to call it a problem, but it's definitely a t an interesting thing to solve to preserve the ethos of what the martial art is, but also accept the growth of kind of how do you get this into more people? How do you give opportunity to people that have dedicated their lives to this to have a school where people want to come and sign up because they saw it on ADCC or they want to come and sign up because they saw Eddie cornering someone in the UFC and that's their entry point. So how do you, how do you keep the originality? How do you keep the combatives element 
but then still allow the sport to grow in a like in a positive way. It's a it's, it's a hard it, thing. It, it, it's a puzzle to solve. But uh, let me explain. Yeah. Let me explain a little a little more because I don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers, and I probably have. And and you know, it is oh, what you it can is. ruffle them. Um, I'm 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 a little controversial with this stuff because I'm very passionate about what it is and 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 where it came from and my roots and i consider myself a traditional gracie jiu-jitsu exponent that's how i consider myself i completely understand when hickson talks about amateur black belts there are black belts in the world which are world champions but they're amateur black belts and i understand why he says that um i'm no one to judge anyone i'm not a world champion i don't have a huge competition record um, yes, I fought MMA, I fought sport jiu-jitsu, I fought no gi, but I'm, I'm nowhere near the level of the kids growing up in the academies today. I'm not. But right. one, one thing I place great onus on is as a teacher, what am I doing here? What is my job? Am I propagating a, a sales pitch which says, hey, come to my school. It's a very nice school, clean environment. Everyone's friendly. And I'm going to teach you to defend yourself. And lesson one, spider guard, De La Hiva guard, <laughs> Berin Bolo. This is Robert Drysdale's big gripe. He shares the same gripe with you. Yeah. Okay, great. It's great to know that, <laughs> He's that like a, a legend like that has the same view. But, but my, <laughs> yeah. my, my thing is this. When I teach jiu-jitsu, I'm teaching for the community as a whole. That means age, no boundaries. Weight, no boundaries. Um, athleticism, no boundaries. Do I have elite athletes that train here? Absolutely, I do. Do they do well in combat sport? Absolutely, they do. But my objective for the rest of my life teaching jujitsu is someone comes in, hi, nice to meet you. Why are you here? I'm here because what you said, I feel weak in my office. I feel weak because I can't approach my boss to ask for a pay rise. I feel weak when I walk in the street with my kids that something may happen. The empowerment doesn't come from jujitsu. The empowerment comes from their ability to be able to say, hey, I can do the warm up that everyone's doing. I can do the techniques that the, the, the teacher's showing. I'm able to train with these guys without the fear of injury or risk of not going to work tomorrow or having to keep up with the athletes. I'm yeah. able to have a mindset of self defense should the need arise that I'm able to say, Hey, no, that's not going to happen. And anything beyond that, my training kicks in. But if my first lesson is welcome to the Academy, I like to show you this, uh, Berin Bolo to back take people leave jujitsu at that point or the warm up is yeah. so hard for them. They can't even complete the warm up. The poor guy or girl goes away and says, that jujitsu is for, for elite elitist is for athletes and that's crazy right. to me Abe. that's crazy in the sense that so crazy and that's why i consider us traditional gracie jujitsu um coming from an instructor like hoyler who's a decorated world champion my weight my size right. how could i not respect the sport how could i not champion those who are doing that and respect what they're doing going back to my point of andre Garvol getting slapped twice Man, if you slapped one of the Gracies, even if you got close to in the early days, even now, what do you think is going to happen in their later years? What do you think is going to happen? They're going to wait for a tournament. So what, what do you think is happening in that moment? Um, because so with this with this question, I, I think we both know the answer, right? That that, that wouldn't have happened. It, it, it wouldn't have been allowed to happen if it were Hickson, if it were Hoist, if it were... Horian, if it were Helio, right? But the it's or, not or Henzo or any that, of those guys. But it's also not to say that like the Galval can't handle himself, right? Absolutely, it, and it's not, not to say that he's that he's so unskilled or or so far from the original uh, birthplace of jiu-jitsu that he didn't know how to do it. But, but so on that point, Abe, I think he is. Yeah. Andre really? Galval, maximum respect to this guy maximum respect for his achievements and his accomplishments. I think he is so far. And I think a lot of them are so far from that initial point, that point of jujitsu, that entry point of jujitsu, because if he wasn't, his primary objective should have been 
Gordon Ryan, don't come close to me. Stay away. Don't come close. Hands up. Stay away. We're arguing now. Stay away. You come close, sidekick, punch, elbow, whatever it is. Don't come close. Because the original text of jiu-jitsu has strikes, has clinches, has takedowns, has throws, and finally has ground grappling. The last place we want to be on the, on the, in a fight is on the ground. The last place. So I think I wonder, they, they I, are I so wonder to what, to what degree, though, it, it's hard to analyze in those settings. I feel a little bit. It's a little tough to analyze because there's this showmanship element and this marketing element that it, that is certainly running underneath or behind all this, where here we are talking about something that happened in the lead up to an ADCC that a lot of people watched. Does that happen outside of the ADCC arena? Does that happen without the need to, sil- to fill seats? Uh, and what happens if, let's say, a Gordon Ryan was in San Diego with no film crew, no posse, no group of people. He sees Andre Galvao and he goes up to slap Andre Galvao outside of Whole Foods. I think that what you're saying kind of how ha- I think in that setting, Galvao does exactly what you're talking about. I think hands are up. He creates distance, leg kick, something like that. So I wonder, like, do they let this slide? Do they invite in this WWE WrestleMania mm, kind of weird marketing thing? Maybe, but I don't think so. Man, listen, no cameras, no lights, no no people. Go up to Nate or Nick Diaz and do that. Caesar Gracie Black. Go up to them. I'm not just saying Gracie Black, but go to those guys and do that. At any moment. What do you, go yeah. to go well, to go yeah, to that's not happening. <laughs> right. I mean we we have seen seen the video of that happening on uh in So so what New I'm Orleans, saying right? is this exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this diluted form of self defense that we're seeing. Yeah. It's not, in my opinion, in my opinion, jujitsu. It's not jujitsu because you take one slap, hell breaks loose. Because, right? You know, if you come back, if I go back to the school, my school, after you know, proclaiming self defense, not that, and I'm not bashing anyone. I'm just talking about the philosophy, mindset, and teachings of jujitsu. How far they've strayed. That would never happen. Mm-hmm. I, I would be embarrassed to return to my school, propagating right. what I do. Yeah, like you kind of have to, well, you're always, any of us that are entrepreneurial in any regard, you're always representing your brand wherever you are, whether you're right. taking a phone call from someone you don't know, buying a car, or standing up for yourself in the street. I mean, you are a representation of EKBJJ Absolutely. anytime, 365 days a year, wherever you are. So if you're on an airplane and someone's being a dickhead and no one's doing anything about it and someone's about to, you know, obstruct or hit an old person or an old lady, right. you kind of got to stand up and do something about it. Tom right. Blast, the Blast talks about this all the time, right? It's like, what are all these people doing standing around doing nothing? And I think that is a lost element of the martial arts mindset. Is Ab- this... Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying for one minute the guys we've spoken of. I'm sure if, if, if they had a random scrap, they would come out on top without anyone who trains jiu-jitsu right. would. For sure. The danger that I'm talking about is this. Come and learn self-defense at filling the gap school. And the lesson one is right. they're teaching this stuff. Lesson Why do you fi- think that is? 50. Because jujitsu is not, in my opinion, perceived what it really is anymore. Traditional Gracie jujitsu or jujitsu, let's just say jujitsu, Japanese jujitsu, it's not what it's perceived as anymore. We're considered by people to be a group of guys who roll on the ground in spats and tight tops, and we roll on the ground with sweaty men every day, and, and that's life. That's fights for us. And that's why it's an uneducated approach when people see the UFC. You sit in the stands and you hear people say, get them up, get them up. They're completely uneducated. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that's definitely, that's, a, that's why I only watch, uh, I only watch fights with people I train with. <laughs> but <laughs> I we, can't do it. I can't, no, I can't go watch a fight with somebody that's too. like a casual man. It really grinds my gears, dude. Me, I can't, I'm like, yeah. nah. It's crazy. But we bring this on ourselves. We have brought this on ourselves. This isn't, no one did that. Roger Gracie gave a really good interview after the Tim Kennedy fight. And he said, I have to go back and train jujitsu differently now. Now, Tim is a savage. You know that. 
from our, our team back there, yeah. right? And when he said that, the GOAT, the greatest to ever do it of his time, I was like, man, that's a big statement. Was he training jujitsu as originally taught? Or had he strayed so far that he'd oh, I need to wrestle? And, and granted, it's all there. But surely if, if you're that guy with that name, you should be understanding or at least teaching that text. You know, you should be at yeah, least I mean, doing it's, that. It's, it's got to be tough with the, the Gracie name, you know, as the last name. I mean, you see this with recently with Kron, right? When Absolutely. Kron came back and he fought again, and it was like, it's tough, man. I mean, it's, I think. And, and, and that you've raised listening... a really good point there with Kron. Yeah. You've raised such a great yeah. point with Crom. What do you Love, what do you think about that? Love knowing Crom. the family, uh, working alongside the family and watching the fight. Like, what do you think about? We're definitely straying away from what we were talking about before, but like, what what are your reflections on on watching that? We, we have to be just on both sides of the fence. No matter what we say about mm -hmm. it, we have to be just. And being just means me saying, I feel that Cron strayed so far away from that path that he's mm -hmm. now. A boxer all of a sudden you know he's become a, a striker y using right. the the pizzao, the the stump kick the side kick incorrectly in my opinion i'm not bashing him i'm just saying from what i'm seeing attempting right. to jump guard attempting to do these things that you would never see those guys teaching or doing i think it is important to separate uh, to some degree professional mixed martial arts as a sport and martial arts jujitsu as an ethos as a philosophy Absolutely. as kind of a way of life but also accepting each one for what it is like uh, there's definitely some false sense of security that i see people i i'm a big fan of what martial arts does uh, as you were talking about with the self-efficacy the confidence the ability to believe in yourself changing people's perception of who they are at work all of these things that uh, you see a lot in fitness, too. Someone's never trained before. They get on a good program. They start to feel better about themselves. They sweat. They feel good. They lose weight. They're more confident. That affects their workplace, their relationships, and their whole life's overcome. It can happen in a gym setting. It can happen in an academy setting, right? That's a very powerful outcome Absolutely. of martial arts or fitness. And when you're looking at something like Kron's performance or, or sport, you have to recognize where the sport is. And it is a mixed bag of two guys meeting on a day where both of them are capable of winning and you have to bring so many different elements to solve the puzzle of your opponent to do the dance to figure out what's going on and, and then come out on top and it isn't ufc one right it's ufc 300 it's 300 events 299 Absolutely. events since the first one they did it's a different game yeah but if you're the average person coming in who doesn't feel confident, who doesn't trust themselves when they go into a, a dark street, when they're in a supermarket by themselves and they, someone cuts them in line and they kind of cower back, you will benefit from going and learning Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. You will mm -hmm. benefit from being surrounded by other people that are building you up and trying to make you better. And that's a very unique, energetic place to be. And it's something that martial arts, I think, does so phenomenally well. And it hits you on a personal level. Every person who's still doing jujitsu today that started five years ago, they got, they, they felt that change, something changed in them. And that's like, dude, if you sold that at stores, you couldn't keep it on the shelf. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm in complete agreement. And that goes back to our very first point of UFC one versus UFC 300. Yeah. Completely. And that also plays into now it's a style against a style, a strategy against a strategy. Who's quicker? Who's the better athlete? Now we're seeing athlete, like, do you remember in the Rocky films when, I don't remember the Rocky, when the Russian guy was the elite athlete? Yeah, Ivan Drago. Right. They had him punching the things right. and it was, they had all and the scientists. Like, right. <laughs> That's where we're at now with the UFC Institute. Yeah. And it's amazing how much it's, totally. how much it's transformed. But those people yep. are, one or two a piece in a gym. Maybe if you have an MMA, a solid MMA gym, you have a whole, flip, you know, a whole team of these guys. But this isn't for Joe Public. This isn't what we're teaching. That's a byproduct yeah. of something else. And don't get me, don't let me get started on the, 
on the steroid stuff too, because that's another aspect of these athletes, you know? So mm -hmm. there's so many, the wind blows both ways, but, but I'll say this, everything has its place. Sport jujitsu has its place. Just don't sell the market in lie of self-defense because you make us all look bad. I, I'm completely honest with people that walk through my door. If you want to be a world champion and win medals and fight in tournaments at an elite level, this isn't the place for you. If you want to learn to defend yourself, become more confident, become you know more spiritually connected to yourself and various other attributes that jujitsu gives you through the product, through the process, welcome. You know, it's super important. I, I have a, a, so a question for you about, it, it, this is such an odd, it's an odd way to think about this, but I, I really realize how much this does have an impact on it. The gi and no gi thing in jujitsu is, as someone who trains both every week, I train a 50-50 equal amount. I think they're both extremely beneficial for, you know, understanding movement, spatial awareness, all this stuff. Uh, we in the in the short time that I've been doing jujitsu, the I started in 2019, I've witnessed in a snapshot, and I know this was going on before because you know ADCC has been going on for a long time. Guys have been cross training for mixed martial arts for a long time, but you're witnessing to your exact point, and you can see this by how many millions of dollars things like the UFC are investing into these facilities you're watching the athleticizing of a sport. And this happened in baseball. It happened in football. It happened in cricket. Any sport that is watchable, this has happened at some point where brands and businesses recognize that through the athlete, you can garner more income, fill more seats, sell more jerseys, whatever it is, right? And as a result, be being the athlete becomes a more competitive experience because the guy next to you is competing for the same thing. So now you're seeing training regiments, guys spending, you know, a quarter million dollars on camps, flying all over the world, the best equipment. And so you're watching a sport that, not to say that Hoist wasn't an athlete, he absolutely was. But now you're seeing guys where the prerequisite is that you must be extremely athletic and gifted to even break into the place where you can start to get to a point where this becomes your career. Mm -hmm. And it's a unique time. It's an exciting time. But what that's doing is it's changing why people get involved. Like when I talk to, uh, when I talk to Richard Bressler, hearing you talk about it, when I talk to uh, these several gentlemen from my academy who've been doing this forever, the entry point was very different. It was almost like they were an outsider who found martial arts and it welcomed them. Now you have people that are not outsiders. Mm. They're collegiate athletes. They're competitive university athletes. And they're finding it completely for a different reason. And I wonder how much, like, how much of the gi physically, and I mean, I mean the kimono and the belt system and how you treat all of this hinges on that because that's the thing that people think is starting to go away, right? That with the Gordon Ryan spectacle and ADCC and it's uh, mimicking of, of kind of UFC antics, it, it, it's all sliding this way. And you see combatives and gi jujitsu being pushed. How do we maintain that? How do we keep that alive in a way where it all kind of benefits and fuels each other instead of getting pushed over. And now that's just stuff that weird people in pajamas do that doesn't really work. Mm, good question. What do we do? Good. <laughs> yeah, really good. And I think there's two, two sides to that. Again, one is when does all of what you just said become a negative? Firstly, when does that become a negative? The brands, the business, when the business become more than the athlete, the athlete is no longer the commodity as we see that. Uh, we see them, we hear them complaining about being underpaid. We see them being almost misrepresented in their, in their field. We've, we've seen people, um, you know, not allowed to have their own sponsors. And, and when does this become bad for the athlete? And I think that, that itself becomes a very dark place where they're fighting for a purse and that's their purse. That's their worth. That's the ceiling of what they get. That's their worth. Right. And, and, and I think we're going to see a tired turn in, in that, you know, the brands and, and the, the, 
the corporations now, they're not even businesses, they're corporations, million dollar corporation. The gi versus the no gi thing has never been an issue. Hoyler, who I believe is one of your instructors, who yeah. who I love dearly, who I spent most of my journey growing up around and, and training with, would train with the gi for ADCC up to a week before, three days before he would actually go and and compete. Ask oh. him, ask him in the early days. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't take the gi off. And people would ask him. And he said something very valuable. He said, my jujitsu is not, um, excuse me, is not a yeah. re rep representation of gi grabbing. And if you watch all of his fights, spoilers fights, the, the gi grabs he uses, they're not very technical. He's amazing at getting people to the ground and guard passing, and that's his whole game. Reckless abandonment in the guard pass, control them, and just maul them. And, and so when he took the gi off, there was no difference because he was always finding anchors around the body. And, and I just think right. it's always go going to be that. We don't teach a lot of gi grabbing stuff here, worm guard and this and that. We understand it. We have to. But, but the ultimate goal is how many times do people practice? This is how you develop pressure. This is how you, right. you hear Hickson talk about this, how you connect to someone with or without the gi. This is how you feel more than you do. And it, and it, and I think that is a learned skill over a period of time. And on the belt system and the, the rank system, this is being lost daily. What makes a good black belt? What makes a black belt? Someone who trained 10 years, someone who can tap everyone in the academy, someone who can tap all the black belts, and then someone comes along and taps him. So shouldn't he not be a black belt anymore? Should he have to remove his black belt? Right. Just, just like a pecking order. In, in the UFC, when we see number one gets knocked off and becomes number two now, or number three, right. or number 13 knocks out number one. If I get tapped in my academy or in a, in a tournament, I have to take my black belt off and go back to brown belt again. <laughs> you know, where does it end? Where is the guidelines? Yeah, yeah. And, and this is why I believe that, let me show you, that this, this book, is the ground rules, the master techs that puts everyone on a level playing field, everyone. If you know those positions, if you can teach those positions, if you can understand the connective ac aspects and the, the technical attributes of how those positions fall into both sport and self-defense, you're a black belt and everyone's on a level playing field, which is where curriculum based training comes in into play because now we have a level playing field. We can have a guy who's 60 years old and can become a black belt. We have a young athletic guy who doesn't become a black belt by beating up everyone on the mat and proving how tough he is. And in the process, we lose students and he, him and one other with ears bent over just and ugly faces are just the guys here training, you know? And I think that's what's lost. I, I think, I think for, so I, I am, I think it, it, to some degree I'm, I'm a blend of all these things. Like I, I've always been drawn towards martial arts. I read about it. I read the history about it. I've loved watching martial arts movies when I was younger. I, I love the movement of your body. Like it's, it's taking yourself through space in a, in a very cool way that allows you to defend and attack. And it's this beautiful art, right? Yeah. It's a martial art. It's not just martial warfare. It's martial art. And I think that there's a lot of psychological and physical components to that that are beautiful. And I also come from an athletic background, strength and conditioning. That's my bread and butter. It's what I've done my whole career. It's what I help clients do. And, and I absolutely love it. And I train super hard all the time. And when I go to jujitsu, I've realized the longer that I've done this, to me in my head... I think what a black belt means when it's a real when it's a real one is it's actually a, a a mindset. It is it's something that's happened to the brain of the person that wears it. It's not something that's happened to the body of the person who wears it. Because what you said, there's if you take a forty five year old black belt who's been trained jujitsu their whole life, and you give me a twenty seven year old collegiate wrestler with two years experience. Even if that person's black belt skill, their jujitsu skill is extremely proficient 
it's possible, just like it's possible that Izzy gets beat by Sean Strickland, it's possible Absolutely. that that person can get beat. And it doesn't mean that the black belt doesn't deserve their tenure and the time they've invested. But someone who invests in the people around them, someone who embodies the the mindset of a martial artist, of teaching people to be confident, teaching them to learn how to stick up for themselves, giving them an arena to try to learn all that kind of stuff as well in an academy, and the, the evolution of the actual person, that's when you can tell. When you meet someone who's, who's a black belt who's been doing it for a long time, it's how they carry themselves. Mm -hmm. It's how they act around other people. That, I think, to me, speaks a lot more to the belt system than how many people do you tap on the mat in a training session. I really think that's much more a product of, of skill, yes, but strength and athleticism combined with skill. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. If you're faster and stronger and, and you throw the guy and take his back, does that mean you're a better practitioner? Not necessarily. But the mindset, that's what sticks out when you talk to people like I had the pleasure of, of having lunch with Hoyler and a couple of other professors at our academy after a seminar. It was six of us. At was this it in Mexican this restaurant? Oh, okay. I thought it was the seafood. Sea it was, oh. No, no. It was random. It, it was in San Marcos. And just hearing, you know, like sitting with, with Hoyler was, that was a special moment. It's cool. Absolutely. That you are talking to someone who is, and this is more and more rare, they dedicated their life to something. Their not, whole not, life. Not only did they dedicate blood, sweat, and tears. Literally. Yeah. That's a black belt to me. Absolutely. And I don't like that's what I want to see preserved. I don't mm. care if it is in a gi or a, no gi or if they have a record or don't have a record, but I would love to see that thing, that like headspace preserved mm. no matter what happens to the sport side of it yeah I'm, I'm in agreement i mean as you mentioned you came from a strength and conditioning performance style background i'll put it like this to you was any part of that academic meaning did you have to sit exams and learn certain things before you were qualified or, or did was it just given to you like you're now a strength oh no it was studied studied for sure Perfect. lots of continuing education and mentorship and time Perfect. spent learning from others and then time spent teaching that information to other people that are starting and coming up. Absolutely. So it was an academic. There was something at the end of that that said, there you go. You are now by our standards certified to be a strength and conditioning or whatever it is. Right. 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 Yep. And, and this is my whole point on the black belts that there has to be a level playing field somewhere where mm -hmm. the IBJJF does, doesn't do this, but, the Jiu Jitsu Global Federation does, where it has standards set out. And the standards are achievable by everyone. And there are, to some degree, exams. We have to be able to proficiently execute these moves, not just execute them, but teach them, understand the deeper understanding of a student who is blind or deaf, and be able to transmit that information to those students on a level that they understand. When you raise a group of people that have an academic understanding of something, anything, with a qualification at the end, a black belt and a certificate, I think that keeps the integrity, that keeps the, the level, and that also lets everyone know that, man, I went through something to get this. I didn't just show up, tap everyone in my academy, and there's your belt over a period of time. Right. That means that everyone's on a lame level playing field. And personally, I don't know anything that has an academic attachment to it that doesn't have exams, testing, teaching methods, all of this stuff. Um, and that's what I feel is lacking in jujitsu at the moment, where, you know, if you go back in the early days when Grandmaster Elio was teaching, we hear them talking about he had a criterion on the mat, off the mat that would make people a black belt. Then he had a professor's exam, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, those black belts today are incredible. They still are. These older black belts, they still are. Yeah. Doesn't mean the younger guys cannot run through them using what, whatever they can. But remember, the original <laughs> art was back was back to what it really was. And, and I, th I feel that's what's being lost, Abe. Um, 
and it saddens me, you know. Um, Wait, I want to I wanna do a little uh, a time travel here, because you mentioned 1993, I think it was, you were in Brazil, right? 96. 96, sorry. 1996, you're in Brazil. Can you take me back to, like, what was it like being there at that time, learning jiu-jitsu, being there? On, I, I mean, that's kind of like, in my eyes, given the, the history, that's kind of a heyday of it being represented, practiced. It's still a little nuanced, not quite as popular. It's not new, right? It's been around for a long time. But what was it like being there in 96 on a, on a jiu-jitsu <laughs> mission, so to speak? Yeah, so 96, everyone was spitting fire in the academy. Not me, but others. Yeah. And walking into a place where I didn't know what I was walking into, um, Abe. I was there looking for hoist after seeing the UFC. Mm -hmm. um, so walking so in. So you just fly, you flew down by yourself? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was no YouTube. There was no one here. There was a yeah. guy who came much later to the UK um, who was teaching crazy jiu-jitsu, it was called, because he was Brazilian and the way it was spelt was crazy jiu-jitsu. And a lot of the UK guys will know who I'm talking about. But I went out there and found the academy and uh, it was above a school. And I still have long-term friends there now, but the training was very different. Remember that this was the UFC had broken or, or Horian had did his thing. Hoyler was still there. Um, Megaton was, there was a lot of guys there, the guys that you probably train with and, and remember Leo Xavier was there. There was a lot of guys there and it was literally uh, a bloodbath. Not, not many people speak in English. Um, yeah. I can remember that uh, some of the people they're saying they're going to make me quit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was horrendous. The amount of times that I, I so, got put to sleep there and there's all kinds of stuff that went on. That, so on our, on our, conversation here was it technical like absolutely I, when i was. hear blood bloodbath i'm gonna quit this makes me think of collegiate wrestling this makes me think of academies where people are trying to just prove that they're better than everyone so so how yeah. did well that's how exactly it how it was i mean you have to remember the they were at war and, and I, I literally mean this with the luta livre guys you know there yeah. was there was other schools of jiu-jitsu that were emerging you know, Alliance and the Baja Gracie guys. And, and I witnessed some incredible things back then that were incredible at the time, but I didn't realize how incredible. An example was Marcio Fatosa. Do you, do you know that name? Nope. He was the golden boy of um, the Baja Gracie, of Gracie Baja. He was winning everything, a rival of Hoyler and these guys. He was a rival. And... We went to a place in Bahia and I witnessed a, a fight, a closed door fight between, it was a grappling fight, by the way, between him and- No striking. No striking. And it was a grappling fight between him and Half Gracie. And I'm not gonna tap and tell, you know, I'm not gonna say the outcome, but from my understanding, my limited understanding, this was at their headquarters then, and there was a lot of well-known people there. From my understanding, um, that that was a fight between people who should have competed in a tournament, and they took one bowed out, so the other one could take gold. Mm. From my understanding, I could be wrong, but from my understanding, gotcha. Um, and that was insane. So that was at Baja Gracie, Gracie Bar, and Holetta was there. Uh, who else was there? Oh, the old school guy, Carlinos was there, and after. Our conversation. I'm going to send you some pictures, which uh, yeah, you, please, which you can you can see for yourself. Um, yeah. The same kind of thing was happening every day in Gracie or Maita, in in the main academy. People battling really hard in there because they're competing now. It, it was the peak of it of its time, and watching them all spit fire. And I was nowhere on that level. Trust me on that. Um, yeah. But but watching it was completely different to what we we see now. Um, Old old ways, you know. They, they were still developing stuff, and so yeah. So for but the, with this, like this is where I think this is where I get pulled in the other direction because I'm like, it's always been this way. 
it has it's always um, been tenacious it's been murderous right it's been gnarly it's jujitsu it's not yeah. it's not pat this isn't uh your weekend krav maga class but, to learn but how remember, to like but remember fend hey, off the no, no. but remember back then hickson was fighting in the valley to the opens hoyler was yep. fighting in pride you know you had henzo in pride you had hoyler in adcc yep. too you had high and gracie fighting in pride the gracies were a unit of let's all get they to, all had to right, represent yeah. right which was the gracies versus japan or brazil versus japan yeah yeah so those were different times and they were training no gi with the gloves yeah. so it was still jujitsu still talking about positions and techniques and this and that and and um this picture let me show you this real quick this was two weeks after hoyler fought sakuraba he still has black eyes that's in gracie Omega in brazil <laughs> i love it <laughs> um, oh, it's so rad yeah. so so these these things were were happening in front of me and and back then i yeah. man, this is jujitsu to me this is what i came to learn but where's hoist hoist was in torrance at that time teaching in the academy right so golden years for me yeah and i was standing in the room with giants and didn't even know they were giants now i wasn't the only one there were people in there that were, were icons today that i was like oh man i was in the room with this guy when this was happening blow my mind and and i wasn't he, so, go ahead so go do, ahead. You, do you think that the do you think that the self-defense approach the when i think of this if if i'm thinking about this not as a practitioner but as a business person, as someone who wants to keep the lights on in their academy, as someone who wants more students, right? Because you need students to pay membership to make the business run. The self, the self-defense thing, it makes a lot of sense to me because that's low barrier to entry. That's like a hey, come in here. We'll teach you how to feel good, to how to protect yourself. Uh, you can kind of silo this off to be a less intimidating experience when someone comes into the academy because they don't have to go to war with these dogs that are training to be competitive or whatever. Uh, so I wonder, like, as as jiu-jitsu got further away from this time in Brazil and when the Gracies are out there, you know, fighting for their name every single weekend, yep. Does do you think that this self-defense is kind of a watered-down version that allows jiu-jitsu to propagate by bringing more people in the doors that wouldn't have been interested if it was represented as what it really was going on behind closed doors in settings like this I why do you think that that approach was leaned on to to grow jiu-jitsu i think we have to go back in time a little further mm. elio only taught private classes to wealthy people inside the academy the group class never existed originally. And the lessons were made up of what we see in the master text and others that were allowing these people to come in and fund what they were doing, which was these private classes of self-defense. That was also around the time where these challenge fights were going on inside the academy. Because if we go back in history, we have George Gracie, Gaston Gracie, were fighting in circuses and all, all this kind of stuff and Carlos Gracie and all of this stuff. But I believe the switching point was the family had represented itself well enough in Brazil that mm -hmm. they went to Japan using the same self-defense techniques. And here's why I say that. What do we see Hickson using in his fights or even Hoyler? Let's talk about Hoyler because we both know Hoyler. Hoyler comes out, high guard. This is not jujitsu. High guard, sidekick, sidekick, right. sidekick. Agreed? He gets yeah, into yeah, the yeah. clinch. Body lock takes down high the guy. Clinch. Yeah, take a hook or a leg hook, whatever they call it. Take down the guy. Lands on top. Pounds him a little bit. The guy turns over, rear naked choke. Does that right. look like anything you've seen before in a sport jujitsu tournament? No, I I mean watching the watching Hoyler watching Hickson in these in these early bouts, it it really is. For anyone who hasn't, it's worth going and doing. I I mean, it's really something spectacular. When Absolutely. You see, uh, I forget his name. Um, Hickson fought. It's in the documentary right, where he's all beat up. He's getting massages from Hoyler in the back room, 
and he's like, you can see it on his face. He's kind of done. He goes out and he fights that. It's a massive. Who's that guy? Massive. Oh my god, the guy was like David Levecki. Huge. David Levecki. Maybe that's who it was. A a pride fight. It was so big, and he beats him. And it's David versus Goliath. I mean, you see it happen in real time. It doesn't really make sense. And and what was he using? He was using the same stump kick going forward, clinch, body lock, takedown, mount, few punches, rear naked choke, or on. It's it's, that's the components that are not being taught in schools. That's the components that have been yeah. lost, Dave. And so we are talking about two totally different things here. Not only are we talking about two totally different things, we're talking about two totally different chains of thought, two totally different, two totally different ways of preparing humans for combat, whether it be a sporting environment or a street environment, but manipulating the situation to make it look like we are teaching what they're teaching over in that school, but really we're not. And the danger comes when these athletes enter the arena of the UFC, which we've seen, get the hell beat out of them, and then they give jujitsu this name of, oh, they only roll on the ground anyway. Because the elements have changed. I, d- I don't believe that, that the, t- the, the teachings have changed if you go to the source of that style. Of yeah, teaching. that's the hard part. It's up upholding. I th- I think it's important at any academy. Hear me bashing the to, hell out of this well, uh, self-defense. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, well like for anybody um yeah, you never you know, you never know what you're going to get hooked on. Uh for anybody getting involved, like it you need to know how to start standing. Like that's an element of course yeah i don't remember the last time i saw people walking around in a supermarket on their ass right (laughs) you walk around you stand up so like if something happens that's going to be the start point and so you can't get it twisted by just doing uh jujitsu on the ground a slap hands and look the the person the same same thing in the tatami same thing on the tatami when we train everyone kneels down slaps yeah and that's not developing the culture that we're talking about because they're going to tell you like this, you oh, need you need both. to go, exactly. Oh, you're going to go to, yeah. oh, now you go to a wrestling class and learn wrestling. Now you go here and, right. and, and learn sambo. And jiu-jitsu has those things, but the yeah. instructor's not teaching them. We, or he doesn't know them. Not his fault, but he doesn't have them. He doesn't know them. I, I would agree. I, I think, and this comes from, um, this is definitely from a coaching perspective of, of being someone who, who always has a program for my client, you know, like I, I always go back to the program as this architecture that you can stray from, but only within good reason, only if it makes sense to stray from the architecture. So if someone comes in and you have them plan to do squats, but they come in and their ankles all blown up that day, well, maybe you can't squat, but you can do other stuff. So you stray from the architecture Mm because it makes sense. But you're working within the remit of what you a hundred percent, right? And that that is an important part of of anything is that there you want expression, especially in in an art form. You want people to have their style. Eddie Bravo having his style is a good thing for the overall ethos. It's beautiful. This guy creates systems and then has this way of marking them that connect with people that otherwise wouldn't even get involved. That's good. But you need to have some sort of structure to where. You you iron out the basic things over and over, maybe even sometimes to the point where it's not that fun, but those basic things allow you to become better at expressing other parts later when you develop more skill. But if you don't have those basic mechanics or basic skills, don't, what, you learn how to tie someone's gi behind their leg and grab it and just flip them over and they're, before they even know what happens, they're on their ass? When are you ever going to do that? Anywhere. You're going to grab mm. someone's jean jacket and stuff it up their butt and then grab their collar and pull them down? That's I hate stupid. You. They're going to punch you. you in the face. <laughs> you know? I, I, They're going to punch hate, you in the I face. Hate you. But, but what, what I'm not saying is that those guys couldn't do well should that should it happen. They, they, they wouldn't do well. My, right. my fear is that we're talking about systems. We're, we're talking yeah. about certain systems. Eddie Bravo has a system. Gracie University has a system. John Danahar has a system. Gordon Ryan has yeah. a system. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from here? We cannot just show up in the academy and say, okay, guys, today we're going to do a I agree. leg lock. Tomorrow we're going to do a, a choke. And it doesn't make sense. It has zero sense. What? 
Yeah, I I'm such a I'm so on board with this because you just hit the nail on the head, and I th- I think that you know, like him or hate him, uh, Gordon Ryan is a good example of Absolutely. someone who's who's he's he is like the <laughs> I always think of it like this is so stupid. Uh, do you ever see Power Rangers growing up? Yep. Okay, so Power Power Rangers at the end of every episode they have to fight some crazy foe, right? And so what do they do? They all team up and they form this really big, big power, power ranger, ranger. And, and that can a- overcome the enemy. Uh, someone like Gordon Ryan, he is he is the teamed up expression of him and Donaher, right? Donaher is not going to be on the mats. He's not going to compete. But his brain is so full of knowledge and systems and understanding of the sport. The guy doesn't do anything except think about jujitsu, play out, you know, systems, scenarios, find yeah. them. And then express them through this athlete that he has, who's a, a phenomenal practitioner. And that's amazing. And when you see yeah. it happen. He makes the most, the next most skilled person on earth, not that week, on earth, look like they've never even grappled before. Yeah. And he does it with ease because he sticks to these systems. He sticks to the the downloaded information from his sensei, right, uh, in action and. They that is so beautiful. Like that's so important to. I think that maintains such an, a yeah. lot of the martial arts ethos. Absolutely, it's such a an amazing thing to watch. And uh, I'm taking nothing away from those guys. Absolute athletes, you know, monsters. You know. Again, in saying saying what I'm saying, these guys are what you're saying. They're walking around systems. They they have systems in operation that work. And if we go back in time, we see GSP. Same thing, Firaz Zahabi, Greg Jackson, uh, John Jones, all of these guys that are elite and uh, Khabib for a reason. These guys are are elite for a reason and you can take nothing away from them. But, and here's the the nutcracker. There's a reason why there is only one of these people and there's not hundreds of them in every academy or hundreds of them in every tournament. Do you understand? So, So that, Doing that takes a very special connection and person to do that. And I don't refer to this anymore, this jujitsu as martial arts, although it is. I refer to it more as a martial science in what we're doing here. Um, and, 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 and I feel that the science goes back to the early stuff. And, and I'll keep saying it. Hickson keeps refining. He keeps developing. And I understand like completely when he talks about these things like connection, the ability to do this and do that. And people look at him, go, oh man, that takes too long to learn. I'm not going to, great. You carry on on your journey. Gordon Ryan will carry on with John Danahar doing exactly that, just in a different format. It's yeah. the same system. And it's who you subscribe to, I think, that makes it work. A lot of people hate the Gracies and fair play. Listen, a lot of people hate me. Great. Love it. You know, so do what you have to do. I will keep creating systems i'll keep creating jujitsu systems for people to make their life better to make what they need better for them and i think that's what's important when uh, so i've i've had uh chris howder and chris burns on the show and then two gentlemen uh that i train with go and they they train with hickson in los angeles periodically um every once in a while what is it about training that with hickson that is so different like what is the special thing about that as someone who's who's been alongside him and been able to work with him one-on-one and and see someone who's truly upheld all elements that we've talked about today to the highest degree the highest standard what is it like being in the room with someone like that so, so a let true me master yeah so let me quantify this uh because i don't want to i don't want people to get the wrong impression i spent a very limited time with hicks Okay. And when I say limited time, I'm talking about seminars and going to Los Angeles and visiting and, and this and that. I'm, I'm, on, I'm giving no one an impression that I spent long periods of time with Hickson. Hoyler was the main influence in, in what I had. Every time I've encountered Hickson uh, in seminar form with his teaching or online and what he's doing is he's a very unique individual in the sense that he really embodies this thing. For example, 
one of the a few years before a few years maybe five years ago when the original gracie university in uh torrance closed down i was there for one of his seminars and he was showing some stuff which i'd learned in the original academy in brazil and he said come here phil do this and he was like almost it's almost right now do this and it was a lesson that i took from him before that he'd refined again and again and again, and and for it being something completely different i think like we spoke about john danaher he's that guy that people refer to as the greatest to ever do it in jiu-jitsu for a reason he's so sharp he's so sharp he can he feels more than he does and it's the little movements that change the whole position it's the approach to the jiu-jitsu it's the the connection which people get confused with he he's dad if you go back to choke as you mentioned talks about jiu-jitsu invincible hickson refers to that as invisible jiu-jitsu and what his father's talking about is when jiu-jitsu is completely in alignment and it's understood and it's right there it's unbreakable and we see this with the arm locks we see this with the chokes we see the perfect timing that, that hickson has and when Hickson talks about invisible jiu-jitsu, what the eye doesn't see but the body feels, we're talking about something again that he's refining. I saw an interview with him recently. He's talking about still refining. So I'm eager to learn from him again and see. But yeah, he's a he's a true legend, a true master. But then so is Hoyler in his say, own way. My next question was when you take your the experience you have had with Hickson, the the many experiences you've had in, with Hoyler, learning from him, how are they different? Hoyler, Hoyler's a savage man. Hoyler's always been the guy that's like pedal to the gas. Like Hoyler's like, I'm gonna pass your guard. That's it. You're gonna get your guard. You know, I'm gonna take you down. I'm gonna I'm gonna do whatever I can to you. Um, and he does. If you've trained with him, had the pleasure to train with him, you, you will feel it. He's, like I said, almost reckless abandonment, but with pinpoint accuracy. And Hickson's a little bit of the opposite. Hickson's more like, it's going to be a very crushing experience for you, but, <laughs> but, but it's going to be done with less. Where Hoyler's like foot on the gas, Hickson's more refined in that way, taking nothing away from either of them. Um, yeah. yes, it's a crazy, and Hoyce again, training with Hoyce is another one. The people were saying that Hoyce is not, you know, I've heard the conversation, Hoyce is not that good. Man, Hoyce is good. Hoyce is amazing. You know, I, yeah. I was at a seminar and, and Linton Vassell, who's a dear friend of mine, Bellator fight. I met Linton Vassell, became friends with him through a seminar with Hoyce in the Midlands here in, in the UK. And, and Linton will tell you, he was an athlete at the time. He was a, a freak athlete. I watched Hoyce have his way in the nicest possible way, you know? And <laughs> even even Linton was surprised. And, and you have to understand, this guy is like 6'3", athletic dude in Bellator, now ready to fight for the, for the championship, for the belt. And I was like, this is insane, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's... Ha have you trained Who, who do you think will... Yeah, he, I've I've taken. He did a seminar here that day that I had lunch with him, but he was he was not training that day. I think he was nursing an injury, so he did a lot of instruction, um, and we learned a, a lot of things. But Incredi incredible, to incredible mind, him. incredible mind, super sharp eye, late pinpoint accuracy, um, knows what he's talking about. You know, he's not a guy who's just fluffing up the edge. This guy has been through it, won it, did it, seen it. You know. Who, I, who I, do I, you I, think will hold uh, hold the torch the way that? I mean, I feel like you know the Gracie name is such a, like you said, there's people that that dislike the Gracies. There's people that rave about the Gracies. There's people that can respect their place in jujitsu history, and those that will tell you that they don't have a place in jujitsu history. Who do you think carries the torch uh, in the same way that Hoyler has and? that Hickson did, do we see that again? Is there going to be someone or do we see somewhat of a dispersal and a, a following of this athleticizing of the sport and 
kind of go more down the road of ADCC, more down that road of of large spectacle grappling and, and competitive grappling. Let, Where do you let, think let, this all goes? Let's put it into context. Hoist Gracie. Six fights, one night. Hold on. No weights, no rounds, no time limit, mm-hmm. no weight division, no gloves. We're not going to see that again, firstly. Yeah, that's not happening. Hoyla Gracie, one of the most decorated um, jiu-jitsu guys to ever do it. ADCC champion, um, world champion, consecutively. We're not going to see that again, even by by the standards of others coming through now. No, we're not going to see that. Right. Hicks and Gracie, the rumor is 400 fights undefeated, although that's... That's right. <laughs> you know, that's a discrepancy. Never lost a professional MMA fight in his career. Probably not. That's that's getting harder and harder and harder. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if John Jones is if he comes back and fights, I think he's the last undefeated. So, I don't think anyone does another run like that. Right. Jiu Jitsu fighter undefeated, Hicks and Gracie. So in the realms of what we know. Is anyone going to be able to match that with all of that? Probably, Probably not. not. Probably not. Yeah. So that kind of diminishes those who say they're not relevant. They never did anything for jujitsu, this and that. Without those, would we have really had what we have today? We may have. Who knows? We may have. And, and that's, that's a big question. But to go back and do that in that time, is that possible? Who knows? Who knows? I, I don't I mean, think it's we're crazy. Going to see that. It's it's crazy to to see. It's crazy and it's complicated. I mean, there's so many different factors that play into the popularity of jiu-jitsu at this moment in time, right now, when there's, you know, multiple streaming services that offer your the ability to watch the fight, multiple promotions that are putting it on, millions of dollars being invested into events, rostering the events, getting everyone prepared for them. Uh, the brands and the businesses that are branching off of this opportunity and people, I mean, even people like, you know, Joe Rogan talking about jujitsu to millions of listeners while the UFC is showcasing jujitsu and it's proving itself on live television, that this is the real deal. And even if you think it's not the real deal, it is. And if you're curious, go find out for yourself. I mean, so many things have lent themselves to us being in a place right now where it's big I just hope that through its continued growth, which is inevitable at this point with how many eyes are on the sport, that you see a maintenance of that martial arts mindset, that you see that be upheld mm. to some degree. I and maybe it's fairy tale to like maybe it's not something that other people care about, but I, I hope that I hope that that's still something that people can like come back to. I mean, I feel it. I feel that we may be progressing so far down the lines that history could potentially be wiped out with, with a big focus on Gordon Ryan. And, and you know what these phases are like, you know, it's, I have people come into the school who don't know what, who Hoyce was, who, who don't know who Hoyler is. And, right. and, and that's sad because those are the links in the chain that paved the way for others. Or Halleck with Met, Meta Morris, you know, we had, we've had so much, Eddie Bravo so with crazy. EBI. Yeah. yeah, it's and it's almost pushed in a way now where Gi Jiu Jitsu is lost or losing. But not while I'm here. Not while I have my small <laughs> school in London. <laughs> yeah. Well I, I think I think that there's a place for it. You know, I, I mean I've dedicated a hundred and this will be hundred and ten episodes to wow. the fact that, you know, Congrats, I, I love right? this and it's it's fun. It it impacted you know, obviously my life in a, in a very positive way, but I've also seen it impact other people's. Mm. It's just, it's one medium, right? Like I said before, it could be uh, getting into running. It could be anything that's positive for you that challenges who you think you know you are, flips that upside of its head. And then on the other side, of that, it gives you an opportunity to learn where you can go, whoa, okay. Uh, wow, I can look up to Eddie and I can ask him questions and, and he can teach me and he, he can give me this skill that he's downloaded over his lifetime I, i'm always drawn more and more as i get older to people that have given their life to something it's mm. it's more and more rare it's special it, because 
it's so easy to be pulled in different directions. You start this, but you want to do that because your friend is. You're doing this, but then that's enticing, so you go over there. Mm. But to see people double down on it, and I mean, you approach closer and closer to this idea of mastery. It's 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 well beyond the ten thousand hours, right? It's it's right. so much more than that. But it's yeah. a, a commitment to something that really means something to you, and that's special. I mean, you can't you can lean on that for the rest of your life, and it's, your students it's, will know yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's insane. I mean. This is my 26th year practicing jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, and I've seen a lot of changes, Abe. I've seen Hoist not talking English, Hoyler not speaking a word of English, you know. Um, yeah. Being, having my black belt in 2008, 2007, 2008, um, so 16 years as a black belt. And, and just seeing the evolution, I'm happy and I'm sad, you know, as well, because... Yeah. Now my, my contribution to jiu-jitsu is the community, the people here, the underdogs. Um, and we're established enough here that elite athletes are coming in and and they're seeing the benefit of gi jiu-jitsu, of, of what what it is. That then it, you know, it's it's incredible. It's and it and it is a lifelong journey. And I will do this as long as I can and I will share with as many people as I can. And I will stay connected as closely as I can to the Gracie family and learn as much as I can so that it can be passed on correctly. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that's kind of where I'm going with jujitsu at the minute. I love the sport. I, I'm not bashing anyone who doesn't. I love the UFC. I love the ADCCs. But I think self-defense, traditional Gracie jujitsu is the start point to understand the whole picture. It's funny. I heard someone say, <laughs> I, I am contradicting myself here when I say this, but uh, they were like, oh, you know, gi jiu-jitsu is bullshit. No one walks around wearing robes. No one walks around like that. And then someone else is like, yeah, but people don't walk around wearing spats either. Like it's not. <laughs> no, they you know, do in London. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But to, to Hoyler's point, like he, you know, he trains gi up to, because it doesn't matter. He's training jujitsu. So Correct. whether you're wearing, you know, a towel, a spat, a kimono, whatever, he's doing jujitsu and he's going to do jujitsu to the person uh, no matter what they're wearing. Yeah. Because it's mean, transferable. And of so course it is. And- it's important to practice those of course and on that point i mean it's winter now here everyone's walking around in jackets and jumpers and you know it's dude okay so on I'll, on this last thing this is a funny story uh i was in mammoth uh skiing last year and i was in line this this is the dumbest situation but it's definitely like martial arts in practice so there's this long line to get to this lift and it hasn't opened yet. And there's this guy standing there and my friend and I go and we're like, Hey, the line's long. We're going to go over and we're going to get coffee for everyone. And we'll come back. So our other friends waited in line, but as we were gone, the line moved along further. And so when we came back, our friends were, you know, 15 people further along than when we got there, but everyone in the line saw us leave. They, they knew we were there the whole time, except this one guy. <laughs> So he's standing there and uh, we kind of just gestured to him. We're like, hey, do you mind if we go by? You know, our friends are up there. And he's like, you're not getting by. And it was just, you know, one of those people where from the word go, this guy had a big chip on his shoulder and uh, he got all up in our, you know, I'm holding three coffees and some chips and this guy's all in my face all of a sudden. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking in real time, kind of laughing because I'm like, this is, you know, this situation would bother me normally. It would. But I can recognize that this is a dumb situation and it's mm. not worth my time to mm. get into a thing with this guy and get kicked or whatever. But while I'm sitting there and I'm holding this coffee and I'm looking at this guy and he's got this jacket and it's unzipped and it's all open and he's got uh, you know, a scarf around his neck and he's got all this stuff on. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, you know what? It does work because if this, if he did anything, I would grab his collar so fast he wouldn't even know <laughs> what happened, right? And he would be on the ground if it like I would forego the coffee and the chips. They would be over here, and my hand would be on this collar and on his pant leg, and he would, he, and he wouldn't even know what happened because he was so angry about this thing that's so stupid, mm. right? That's where it actually does fully function, and that's the majority of time, right? Most of the time, it's winter. What are people wearing? So if you want to do the argument of Giver's no, it's it's there all yeah. the time. It's super present. 
And if you practice the principles and you have, you know, a professor like yourself who's invested in the self-defense side of things and you can put it in play and you can fail and you can learn, and you can keep getting better. Jiu-jitsu is not going anywhere. Jiu-jitsu forever. You know, that's the, that's yep. the thing, you know, it's uh, yeah, great story. And, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lucky it didn't go. go I wish the... another time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know another time, another time. Yeah. Uh, but Eddie, thank you so much, brother. It's already been an hour and 20 minutes. This goes by so fast. I'm sure the listeners are sick of me saying that because I say it all the time, but it really does. Um, thank you for taking the time to come and chat jujitsu and martial arts. And it's, it's, it's been a pleasure, Abe. And uh, through our connections, I wish you all the best with your, your podcast. You're doing yes. an amazing job and, and I'm really grateful for you having me. Um, please to your listeners, support a because i know what it's like to to do these things they take a hell of a lot of time and he's dedicate you're dedicating your life to it and most of all yeah. man train jujitsu it doesn't matter what style of jujitsu it is if you like to consider it that gi no gi just be on the mats be around jujitsu and be open to learning everything yes. it's a big thing yeah. absolutely well thank you eddie i appreciate it brother we'll have you on again in the future hey pleasure thank you hey friends abe here thank you so much for tuning into this episode and sticking around to the very end. If you want to support it, leave a five-star review on Spotify or check out www.mainideapodcast.com, join the mailing list, and stay up to date on all things The Main Idea, from future guests, sponsorship opportunities, products that I'm using to help me perform at my best, invites to ask me anything, and any upcoming pertinent information to the show. I cannot do this show without you. It is literally why I show up each week and put these episodes together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart from being part of the community. I hope you have a great day.